Maury Yeston, it's it's a pleasure to talk to you about December songs and also about your career. And I want to start by asking you about something you told the New York Times in 2003 in an interview with Robin Pogrevin. You said, I'm a man of infinite patience. I write things and sometimes they don't see the light for years and years and years. Accepting that point of view in 2003, we're now, you know, 19 years later and December songs is fully recorded with this beautiful Larry Hockman orchestration, and you've got Victoria Clark. Has your patience paid off as it relates to December songs? Absolutely. Abs absolutely. And by the way, let's say with, with 37 in the band, I mean, that's, that's, there's, there are orchestras and then there are orchestras. I mean, pit orchestra is one thing. And, you know, all of the 37 were great professional New York musicians, and some of them were all, almost on the verge of tears because they sounded so wonderful, that lush 37 group. And of course, the tears were, we don't get to do this much anymore because, you know, there's there's uh, electronic machines that create violins and things like that. And you just don't have that experience very much anymore. It was quite, quite thrilling. So in answer to your question, uh, yes, I must be a man of infinite patience, as must anybody who who writes something, unless it's for uh, for an assignment, uh, which, you, which you have to deliver at, at a certain time. And, and it, well, interestingly enough, I was commissioned to write the December songs by Carnegie Hall because it was their centennial year. And so they commissioned a whole bunch of people. Uh, they, a new symphony, a new string quartet, a new, a new uh, piano concerto, a new cello concerto. And I guess they decided to go slumming. And uh, they, they, <laughs> they, they, they wanted a group of cabaret songs. They had uh, Andrea Markovic, who was wonderful. And they commissioned me to write a series of what they thought were going to be cabaret songs or whatever I wanted to, which I thought was rather wonderful because this was a commission that I felt in some ways supposed to honor and reference what Carnegie Hall had done for a hundred years, which is to put everybody from Miriam Makeba and African music and folk music and jazz, as well as the great classical canon. Um, and so, um, because I had, I sit bestride all of those worlds myself as who I am as a Yale professor, as a, as a jazz musician, as a musicologist, as a music theorist, and, and, you know, and a child of the 60s who grew up on Peter, Paul, and Mary, and God knows what else, and, and Ravi Shankar, and all of those worlds, I thought, what can I do to represent that kind of, that, that kind of broad spectrum, uh, and at the same time, represent the greatness of our, our, our historical musical tr tradition. And I thought I could do nothing better than to write a song cycle, a song cycle in the tradition where the first one would be 1816, Beethoven's On the Ferne Geliebte, to the, you know, to, to, to the uh, eternal beloved, a series of unrelated love songs. And then of course the great masters came along, uh, 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 Franz Schubert and uh, a poet who he, with whom he worked, Willem Müller. And and they and they wrote a, a series of song a song cycles, meaning a group of songs that somehow tell a story. And the second one that they wrote is widely regarded as being the great masterpiece of the history of songwriting period, which is uh, a winter's journey in German a Winterreise, and it tells the story sadly right from the beginning of a young man who is who is engaged to be married to a girl. You know, who in, in Vienna and near in the, in the in the vicinity of Vienna, and uh, she jilts him, and and the opening song begins with him going to her door in the freezing cold with snow covering all of the Vienna woods, uh, and 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 he's and the opening line is, "I came here a stranger, and I'm leaving a stranger," and he starts with that and he's singing it in a minor key and and he tells the whole story she said she wanted to marry me but it wasn't so she tell he tells the whole story and then he sort of remembers he remembers how wonderful it was when they first met and schubert puts that in a major key at, at that point and when he comes to the end of it he says, well, the last thing I'm going to do before I leave is I'm going to go to your door and I'm going to write in the snow on your door 
that you were in my thoughts, that I was thinking of you. An die hab ich gedacht. And he sings, an die hab ich gedacht. I was thinking of you in the beautiful major key that he is. And then Schubert does something that just is heartbreaking. He repeats that line again, note for note, word for word, except he sings in a minor key. And he returns to that. And I, I, I saw all, and then I studied, how does Schubert, and Merlin too, how do they manage to tell the, these 20 songs without, you know, enough already, you know? I mean, you know, you're wringing your heart out. It, it, you know, it, it, you know, you, you cried enough already. Um, how, how did they manage to do that and keep it alive? And I looked at it and I said, oh, I see what they're doing. Every once in a while, they remember, it's the winter now. So in one song, they start by remembering spring. And how wonderful that was. And, and then they find incredible things like he comes to a tree. And he sees this tree in the, in, in the woods, uh, uh, the Lindenbaum. And, and, and the, the tree is fluttering its leaves, drawing him by the sound. And he looks at the tree, it's, it, it's in major. And even there's this little thing that goes, da -da, almost the tree calls to him. And then the tree is saying to him in the course of the song, um, you know, uh, come to me. I will, I will bring, I will be your rest. And literally say, hang yourself and you, you won't be sad anymore. And they keep on doing this, going for the positive to again to the negative back and forth so that it's not unrelenting sadness. It's not unrelenting suffering. And these are such great masters. And I thought, well, if there's anything I've ever learned to do, it's try to learn from the great ones. And so I, when I began to write the December songs, I resolved that I would tell my story as inspired as I can by them. Another way of saying that is steal from the best. <laughs> um, but you know, those who listen to the opening song, the December song, uh, uh, which is December Snow. Oh, and by the way, I thought that because I was writing for a woman, and a modern woman in New York, instead of this young man who ultimately at the very last song meets a, a ragamuffin of a hurdy-gurdy man on the outskirts of the forest. And he, and he literally, literally goes, he loses, loses his mind and he says, I'm just gonna go off with the hurdy-gurdy man. This sort of simplistic, almost nonsense of music. He, he, he literally falls apart. And I thought, well, I'm going to write it for Andrea, a modern woman. And instead of wandering the snows of, of, of the Vienna woods, she'll be wandering the snows of Central Park. And instead of, you know, losing his mind and, dis and, and de devolving into, you know, quasi insanity, she'll get over the guy. <laughs> and that was my, that was my guide. Uh, 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 that that was my task, and and then from time to time, if if I had a if I had a, a way or a, in, an inspiration from the great Schubert and and Mueller, Mueller to have an idea, um, I it 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 gave me great inspiration. So that my opening song, she's wandering the snows of and she's wandering across Central Park. It's freezing cold and she's miserable. And uh, and it's in minor. And then she remembers about a quarter of the way through the song, I remember when we first met. I remember how happy we were. And then at the end of the song, she says, Don't but don't, you know, don't think I've forgotten. And she sings, I remember you. And she sings that in minor, in major, because I'm in major. And then, like Schubert taught me to do, I repeated that line, I remember you in minor. And so even the memory of something wonderful is, is, is undermined by her, her journey. And somehow in the course of the journey, she finds a resolve in, in, in my cycle to move on from it. And that's where it came from. And well, I, I wouldn't care if nobody ever sang it. And I wouldn't care if nobody had ever commissioned it. And I wouldn't care if it wasn't even performed in my lifetime. That I wrote it because I was so inspired and so on fire. And 
everything else, I just feel so lucky that that we did it, that it's been recorded about eight or nine times in English, once in French, once in Polish, once in German. And of course, this wonderful performance by Victoria Clark, which I think is, is just for the ages. Uh, she's extraordinary. Well, it sounds like it was written for her. It's yeah. I can't imagine anyone else, and I love Andrea Marcovici, yeah. um, but I can't imagine anyone else singing it at this point. It is such a perfect blend of artist and material. I completely agree with you, and yet, of course, comparisons are comparisons are odious. But you know, if I if I sent you a, 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 a Pia Duvis singing it uh, in German, you'd think it was Schubert. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, or the or the Polish one is it soulful, but yes, I think and you know Vicky and I have, of course, the most wonderful relationship. I you, this is again one of those things that you just can't believe. Uh, you know, um, it wasn't my day gig. I was actually the the director of undergraduate studies in music at Yale after I had gotten my PhD and I joined the faculty, and so for you know uh, uh, quite a number of years, I was in charge of the the. The music majors and I actually taught the introductory course for the majors in uh, in uh, harmony and counterpoint, and uh, Vicky and I go back to when she was in that class <laughs> for harmony and counterpoint. Now, wow. what's, what's crazy about that is that within three years of each other, here's who else was in that class: Tommy Krasker, who founded PS Classics, which is the label on right, and and then of course Vicky, and then. Uh, Ted Sperling, who's the conductor, was also in that class. So it's like, it's like, oh, it's a reunion of me and Tommy and Vicky all there at Yale at the same time. I gave them all an A, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> They're brilliant beyond measure. They are, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you, you subscribe to the adage that write what you know, but if write what you know is something that you believe, is there a part of you that is a, and your own experience that has informed what December songs became? Well, of course, uh, yeah, there is that. But, but there's something else I will talk about. Um, certainly, I, I, it, was, it was very helpful to know what Schubert had done and what Schumann had done and what Brahms has done and what and to see that. And then to know, I, I don't want to do that, uh, but I want to be, I want to be in that family. I want this music to know that it comes from a tradition, you know, and 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 uh, and one of the great things about tradition is that you have to you have to move it forward. And I knew that I would be doing that just by doing something new, uh, from my point of view, and also uh, to be able to stretch every muscle I have, whether it's going to be sound more like a musical theater song sometimes, or whether it's going to be a theme in variations sometimes. Or, or or even have a jazz influence. Uh, I, it, I, I didn't care about that. What I cared about was make the music right for this moment in the story and it will all work out. And I find that's true. I mean, I think I th it's, it's pretty well understood that in my musical theater sh uh, shows, um, I, I take a variety of traditions to do what needs to be done at the time in nine when Guido Cantini is a little boy with all the little boys at the parochial school singing, they're singing a Kyrie in the tradition of, of 17th century music. Uh, and, and, uh, I, and so, uh, so yes, I, I do write from where I know, but what thrills me was what I learned by writing it that I never would have known if I hadn't gone to write it and created something fresh and new and something I hadn't known, I hadn't known I would be doing, I, I hadn't e even known was possible. Uh, I'm, let me tr try and think of something in the December songs. Uh, well, okay, well, not so much possible, but thinkable. So for example, there's there's a moment in it after uh, Bicky, has set, has introduced what her story is trudging through the snow. And then when next thing she, she thinks is that she remembers uh, w when they had met, uh, when our love was new. Oh, oh no, actually, no. The first, second thing she does is she's angry. She's furious at him and she's, she's 
at a, at, a, at a subway station in New York and some homeless guy asks her for money. And all she can think is, what are you doing right now? Are you, are you tying your tie? Are you dressing for work? Are you looking in the mirror? Right? Are you are you is the are the curtains still blowing in the in the bedroom window? I mean our bedroom window? I mean, I mean your bedroom window. And, in other words, she's kind of lost it. And then and then her the third song, she wonders, she remembers, oh yeah, we did bump into each other on a street corner. And she thinks, you know, well, you know, and both of us sort of thought, let's not even say hello. Because what would be the point? You're still you, I'm still me. And so all of these things have positive and negative aspects of them that, that keep on growing. But at one point, after she goes up in the middle of the cycle to the attic, and I was inspired by a wonderful poem by Hart Crane, My Grandmother's Love Letters. Um, it's a magnificent poem in which he goes up to the attic and he finds his grandmother's love letters. And in the poem, he, he tries to remember, how is it possible that I can connect to my grandmother? And he says, are your fingers long enough to play piano keys from so long ago that would go to her and back to you? And I, I love that. I was really inspired by that song. So I said, well, I'll have my young woman go up to the attic and find her grandmother's love letters um and and connect with her in, in in a certain way and and what she does is in the lyrics is if she says you know i could just imagine her she tied them in a bow she finds the bow and and she says i could just imagine her reading them and and gasping from what the boy has just written to her and that air that that she gasped came into her and that air is part of me. I come from her who, and, and finds that connection. At the end of that, my friend Tommy Kraska told me, he said, you know, I think that's probably the place where that turnaround, where some of the healing starts and she's thinking about going on. And I know that was so because instinctively when I had already written it, instinctively, I, he, he told me and explained to me why it was that I had the next song there, which is simply saying, I'm longing to be loved. I'm no longer, I, I'm not going to cry about this anymore. I'm, I, I'm not giving up on love. I, I'm longing for love. And as I was putting, creating that song, I realized there's nothing more that you could say to that. There are no further words. I'm longing to be loved. And I realized the way to do that is to take a great, Baroque form, the form of a Pasacalia. A Pasacalia, you, you take the same short snippet of melody and you repeat it. And if you slow it down, you can write something else that goes along with it. Um, those of you who are listening, you may be familiar with Jesus' joy of man's desiring by Bach, and, uh, and it, it, it's based on a, uh, a, just a hymn, a shirt. Lam di da, di da da. And Bach plays that, but over it, he plays la da 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 di da da di da 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 di da 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 da. And the way Pasakaya works, I can keep repeating the same slow fixed tune and over it, play half notes, and then play quarter notes, and then play eighth notes and sixteenth notes. And so I wrote the equivalent of a pasacalia, you know, which for me is always very happy making to be to be using those things that you wouldn't think of in innovation simply because they're at hand, and they they just come to you. But if you have a kind of a fluency about it, which I really didn't understand, I had. And so I did it. And, and and that's one of my favorite things because because it's per, it's a perfect example of the intersection in Victoria Clark of classical music, popular music, and particularly musical theater because she's a genius actress. And own, you know, Vicky is the sort of person who can say, I am longing to be loved as an actress. 
and get infinite meaning every single time she says that phrase differently or sings that phrase differently. She's a, her, she is a, an exquisite dramatist. Uh, and I, I know this from ha having, having had the pleasure of writing some of the funniest material in the world that she, she in her performance of Mrs. Bean on Titanic, she's just hilarious. And at the same time, she makes us cry because she's in the middle class and her husband is just a businessman. And all she wants to do is interact and rub elbows with the rich people and the swells and go to the big dances and stuff like that. And she breaks your heart uh, out of her yearning and, 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 and longing to do it. I, you know, I, if, yeah. if I may, you know what I find interesting in listening to the recording and I've listened to it about six times. <clears throat> Every time I listen to it, I feel like this isn't just something that was written in 1991. This is something that could have been written today and that maybe there's a greater emotional response to it because of what the last handful of years have, have been like. And I'm wondering, how does it resonate with you? How does it land with you? Yeah, it, it, I, I feel the same way about it. I don't even feel like it sounds like it was written yesterday. I think like it sounds like it was written tomorrow. Uh, and and I think if you're very, very lucky, you've, you've, You've caught on something, and I think what I I think I think I'm writing an, I'm writing a, a great elephant that's much more powerful than I am, and that elephant is Schubert, and 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 Villa Müller. I think that they they keyed in on this form and how how the example that they give gave me something that feels universal back to them. And, and 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 back to me and, and and back to tomorrow regret is regret um heartache is heartache but at the same time hope is hope and recovery is 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 recovery uh, and, and but i think that um i don't know who it was who said and i will try to think of who said it by the end of this interview that nothing but nothing moves me as well more than unrequited yearning it, 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 you know, that is, to me, that is, that, that hooks into my heart always because it's so characteristic of all of us. I mean, sometimes we deeply yearn for something that we had and don't have or that we can't have, but some, there's something about that sense of yearning. And I think that Vicky sings this entire cycle in that, in that key. With you know, with, with 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 that, with that in mind, finding the finding the, the last song was also had to be a discovery, um, because okay, so how so I, she, she's either going to heal or she's not, and and I realized look at what she's just been through. Look at she's look at what she's putting herself through. And to come to a point where she finally does accept the positive of it, but at the same time, the the pain of it, which is which 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 builds us and makes it strong to, for the future, I I I realized the the primary feeling about it, and and I will confess, I had thought of this before when I was writing the end of Nine the Musical. Um, and here's this bastard who's ha having it on with all these women in the world and his long suffering wife who is just putting up with him because she loves him and because she realizes that he's an infant and, and also a genius. And there was one point where I thought, she's got to tell him off. And she does. And, but I thought, well, maybe at the same time, why doesn't she just leave him? Why don't I just, at the end of nine, and I, I was up at the O'Neill when this happened, uh, when I was up there. Why, why don't I just have her walk out and say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the railroad station. So at the end of the, the show that we had done up there and put that we put on his feet, uh, his mistress left him. And, uh, and the spa lady who, you know, the, the actress who he loves, she took off, she went back to Rome. And the line was, he calls out for his wife and the, the, the dialogue line was, uh, she's at the station. And, he, and and I had an idea that 
she would go to the station. And of all the, having finally decided to, to leave him, and I thought, why can, why can she sing? And I thought, well, maybe she should just say, what a relief. Uh, but I found for that story, a different take on that at the end of that show. But that, for literally since 1970 something, that, that idea was in my head. And there it was when I thought, that's, that's, where, that's where Vicky has to go. That's where my young woman has to go there, you know. Uh, nothing left but the shouting, nothing left but the pain, nothing raining but rain. I should be feeling despondent, right? I should be lost in my grief, but all that I feel is, what a relief. And, uh, and especially, she had just run away from this raging river that she had been walking by, which was inviting her to jump and put an end to her suffering. And, and having run off from that, that, that not to kill yourself is a decision to live. And, and that led to her relief. And so I think, you know, the, the spending a year creating uh, a, a almost kind of a railroad car train going from one car to the other and, and going through various worlds of emotions and then finally ending up with some sort of healing um, made me feel like musical theater is not the only way to tell a story. And it made me feel for the first time, I'm really looking, I'm writing two musicals now, but at the same time, I feel now that you don't need to do a whole piece of musical theater to do a musical play for an individual or possibly even for a group of people. And I, I find that I find that now I feel like I'm on my own cutting edge of the future because a song cycle, I think, can bring everything to the table that that a musical can. And whatever Broadway's going through in terms of how much it costs and what you have to do and how you market it and all that stuff. There's something about the world of pure composition in the form of a song cycle that attracts me and and gives me an opportunity just to do my work. Well, and as part of that work for this particular song cycle, where there's you you discuss them as as individual cars on a train. <clears throat> were there any were there any cars that got derailed and didn't make it? Were there songs that that didn't end up in this cycle that you had written? Uh no, because I, I resolved that there'd be no um, no trunk material in this. It couldn't be. It could, no, this when this, this I was I was writing a new thing right from the start here. Right, every every note fresh. Not you know it's you know it's not like it's but that's it's not a Broadway show. You can't get something. You know I uh, I was lucky enough to know Alan J. Lerner, and uh, I had written a song called New Words. Uh, and uh, I played it for the, the producer of My Fair Lady, his name was Herman Levin, and he was very interested in, a, in, in my show about the, the Bible. It was a very funny show about this family of people who live next door to all the Jews. Whatever happens to the Jews happens to them, and they, they were not even guilty. But in any case, Herman loved that song, and Lerner had an office just below his office, and he, he picked up the phone, and he, sa and he said, come on, you have to hear the kid. He, you have, I hear the kid, and, uh, and you'll like him a lot. He's very talented, and yeah, he's got, written a song I think you'll like. So Lerner came upstairs, and I, I played him the song. He said, you, you, he says, he's very talented. He said, you know, he said, um, uh, I forget it was uh, who had uh, given him some pointers. Uh, I'll think of it in a second. But in any case, he said, you come, you come to my office, and, uh, and I'll give you some pointers. And, and I came to his office, and uh, he's a wonderful and generous man. And he said, "You know," he said, "if you if you write something that you think is working out is good, you should always ask yourself, should there be more?" And then he said, "For example, you know, we uh, we 
put a song that we wrote for she for uh, my fair lady into uh, and uh, actually we cut it but we put it into Shishi. I said no way. I said you're trying to tell me that there was a version of of my fair lady that before they went to the to the ball uh Liza do a little sang say a little prayer for me tonight and he wouldn't answer it but that's what he meant obviously uh and uh, and I think that's right if you've written something that you think is ask yourself should should there be more uh and uh, and so that's also part of how the December song has evolved. And also then deciding when to stop also um, was, 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 was part of it. But I had the time to, to compose it. Now, if I'm correct, in, if my memory is serving, New Words is also the song Sondheim wishes that he had written. That was on his list of songs he wished he had written, wasn't it? I don't think it's I don't think it's songs he wished he had written. I never heard that. It's just songs he likes. I think he he uh, he and I did correspond, and he very much. I'm I'm so honored that that Mr. Sondheim liked that song. He did. He did. He said he he said it, it moved him. He said uh, he sent me emails about. It. He said he's not sure why exactly, uh, but he he very much liked it, and it meant the world to me that I had written anything that pleased him. And also that he would be so kind and and, and generous enough to tell me that it uh, um, was a wonderful wonderful thing that he did for me. Absolutely, yeah. I do want to ask you about about two actors who appeared in two of your musicals, yeah. and I and I got to see both of them. I cannot imagine Grand Hotel without Michael Jeter. No, Grand Hotel was Jeter's breakthrough. I mean, but yeah. what what he does in that show was breathtaking and i'm wondering what you remember most about working with him on that show and getting that performance to where it was i remember everything <laughs> i figured don't you would forget. don't forget it's not my show i know okay, it's tommy so, tunes it, no, and no and it was right in forest who wrote the show right so so there was uh, there was right in forest and they were up there in boston mm -hmm. and 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 the show was not doing well they had written they had written, uh, well, just uh, for the, for everybody who doesn't know anything about the start, there's a woman named Vicki Baum, and she was a German novelist in the, the late 1920s, and she wrote a novel called People in a Hotel, mentioned in Hotel, and it took the world by storm. The reason was no novel had ever been shaped like that. There, In her novel, there are seven people staying at a same hotel in Berlin at the same time having nothing to do with each other, except one by one, she tells the story of each of them. The only thing about this plot, this story, is that these seven or eight people are sharing the same disaster at the same time, the fall of the Weimar Republic. You know, people are going to buy uh, cartons of milk at the, at the supermarket or with the, at the market with wheelbarrows full of worthless money. And so it was the first towering inferno. It, <laughs> it was the first airplane, and 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 because of that, that form, that it went. The world bought this novel. It was one of the best se seven at the time, best selling books of all time. And of course, it had to be made into a film. And the film starred, oh my God, it starred everybody from Greta Garbo to you know every great actor in the with the Barrymores, uh, for in the third for the same reason because it was an astonishing new form, and so. They had, so Wright and Forrest had written Song of Norway. They had written Kismet with some of the music of Borodin, Take My Hand, I'm a Stranger in Paradise. And there they were. And, uh, and this show was not working. And so uh, I got called from Mr. Toon, my friend, and he said, um, I have a room for you at the Ritz Carlton Hotel here in Boston with a piano, come save the show. I said, okay, I'll, I'll come, I'll give you whatever, whatever advice I can. And he called Peter Stone, the great show fixer and Peter was in town. So uh, the first thing to do was to meet Wright and Forrest, who are great. I mean, the people who wrote Song of Norway and et cetera. So I sat down with, for lunch with them and they, they were both in their mid eighties. And I said, gentlemen, uh, I'm, uh, I'm in awe of obviously everything that you've done 
And I want you to know, I think it's everybody's worst dream, the idea that you're, you know, you're having a show and you're having some difficulties and there's another writer in town. I just want you to know, I'm only here to give you the best advice I possibly can. And Wright turned to Forrest and said, oh, look how young he is. Doesn't he remind you of us when we first met Cole Porter? So I thought, okay. <laughs> that was worse. That was worth the cost of the train ride up there. Right? <laughs> and they said, no, 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 dear boy, you know, uh, you, you must, uh, you know, jump in the boat, jump, jump in the boat and, uh, and grab an oar, you know? And I said, well, thank you. And they said to me, and this is rather shocking. They said, all we, all we insist upon is that should you write anything that goes into the show, we insist that you have your billing included. And only after they had both passed away did somebody who knew knew them very well tell me the reason they had said that was because when they were young they had been called in to help somebody else with a show and they wrote material for it and that person refused to give them credit and billing so they had resolved that should that that ever happen to them that and i mean i have no words to describe so my my feelings about some of the great, wonderful people I've met in this business and, and, and wonderful experiences I've had. And so uh, in, in, the case of, uh, in the case of Michael Jeter, the problem was, is that, is that Jeter was a dying man. He arrives from, he's left the hospital. He's dying of cancer. And instead of staying in the hospital and dying, he's decided, to come to this hotel, the grandest hotel in the world, right? I mean, the best rooms, the best food, the best music, the best dancing, the best everything, just to whatever little minuscule additional four minutes that's left of his life, he's going to enjoy it at the most glorious hotel, in the mo et cetera. And we didn't get that. And of course, Jeter is, is the metaphor of the whole show. Germany's dying. <laughs> the Reich is dying. Hitler's coming, and 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 then World War II is coming. The, the whole nineteenth century is falling down, and that's Jeter standing there. And and so Jeter has to be this this plodding plodding person walking towards his death. He's literally at death's door, and yet he won't accept. He won't accept that, and he wants still wants to live. It's it's that life force, despite that, but we didn't know. It. So I had to write that for him because if it's a musical, if you have a problem, write a song about it, right? And so I wrote for him when he when he enters the room, the the he, the, he enters the lobby, right, and he sings from the hospital, right. I have come to Berlin, right. I um. I, I've uh, for my life to begin right in this in this place. I want uh, I want to know that I once was here while I'm, uh, all my faculties still are clear and check into my room as I planned at the Grand Hotel, and then he sings and he celebrates that, and and, um, and here's this man who's dying, who's singing about. I want to live. I'm in a palace now. This is what I want to do. And so against, against the forces of death and destruction, here's this man who brings us this, this psychological force of life, nevertheless. And that was the beginning of the new show. And then we had this Baron, right, for David Carroll. But what what's wonderful about Jeter was, uh, and it's it's you know, it, it's a collaboration. We all work towards it. Peter had Peter had cre had had created a scene that was not in the show, and the scene was because we had five characters, each of whom has a problem, just like five people on it in airplane is a problem, or the towering furner is a problem. Peter wrote five telephone booths. And they're all on the phone, and they're all having a problem with somebody on the phone, and we learn about each one's problem, right? And so, and and so that was incredibly helpful in in knowing everybody's story. And Jeter's story was he's calling to the doctor and saying, "No, I'm not coming back," 
I'm not coming back. I want to live. I want to, you know. And so, and so the great moment comes when, when the Baron, when there's a big dance at the hotel, and the Baron comes and brings him into the dance. And Toon did something that only Tommy would do. The dance gets wild and wilder and wilder, and everybody's holding a big bar across the stage. And at one point, Jeter snaps into a dance that Tommy made for him. And he and David Carroll do this terpsichoric brilliance. And this, this dying man comes to life and does something that is so thrilling and so athletic. And at the end of it, he leaps over the bar and the audience goes nuts. And, and, and Jeter was one of the few, and he was, it's like he, it's like he had no, it's like he was just made out of string. He had no bones. He was he was liquid, and so exciting, and and he and it was an absolute force of life. And 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 I so I think Grand Hotel is about is about forcing yourself to fight against death, fight against dying, knowing that. But you know we're all going to die, and so how are you going to live today? Are you just going to force your way through it? And then, of course, I, and again, and you must understand, all this happens in eight days, right? And I got there, I wrote the opening in the first night, and, and, like that. And then we had an issue in the, in, in the second act when David Carroll, the Baron, right? Um, he has to get shot through the heart because um, in the story, uh, the, uh, the, the secretary is being bullied by the German industrialist. And... Uh, and uh, she's sweet on the Baron and, and he's sweet on her. But what happens is, is that uh, the industrialist is, is going to attack her sexually and David is going to enter that hotel room and see that and have a fight with the Baron and the Baron shoots him through the heart. And so we were going to open in, uh, I think it was in Bo our opening night in Boston was about, I don't know, seven days away or very, very close. And I rem remember Tommy, uh, said to me, he's got to have a song. I said, he's dead. He said, yeah, I know, but he's got to have a song. <laughs> he's the star of the show. He's got to have a song. Uh, and I said, but he, but he is dead. He said, but he has to have a song. And so I was, I, I don't want to say I was disconsolate, but I was pretty exhausted. And uh, I, uh, I realized that, uh, well, you know, um, what can be done? We sh he's wearing a tuxedo. We hear the bang of the shot. And I thought, well, what if he just runs forward? And, you know, and I thought, isn't it this sort of um, old, I don't know, if it's not an old wives tale, what is it? It's just sort of a, some sort of myth that at, at the moment of your death, your whole life is supposed to flash before your eyes. And I had the book, the novel of, um, of Vicki Baum with me. And I, I came to the part where he got shot and, and she had written, there lay the Baron in a pool of blood. He had been a soldier in the war. He had ridden on a horseback. Bullets whizzed past him. Not one of them ever hit him. And yet, and I thought, well, why don't I just have him run forward and write a song about that, you know? Uh, why doesn't he imagine he really got to the railroad station with the roses he said he was going to give the ballerina? And, and I said, and as he's singing that and singing, everything in my right life has left up to that. I was a soldier. I, you know, bullets whizzed past me. While he's singing that, his white shirt gradually turns red. And then at the end of the song, we'll go to a blackout and we'll hear the shot again. And so the whole song takes place be between the shot and the echo of the shot that kills him. This, this is what you come up with when you haven't slept in eight days. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote it and I, I sang it for, for tune. And he said, he said, great, we'll do it. We'll put a squeegee in his, in his jacket pocket so he can squeeze the squeegee and make it was just and david was extraordinary the, the 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 wonderful thing about obviously people like love to tell stories about you know boston and what happens in boston um but but it happens in new york too when you can't go to boston um because when you're finally on stage with people revelations occur to you the luxury i had in in the December songs was a blessed year 
to really think about it and to approach it not merely as a dramatist, but as a composer. And also as a composer who, who's been schooled by musicology about how did Beethoven do this? How does Schumann do this? And, 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 and so you learn from your betters and, 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 and take great inspiration. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, there's an old music, there's an old music theory book from the 18th century uh, it takes the form of a, a of, of a great maestro who's who's teaching a young composer, and in one place in the book, the composer says, "Maestro is is borrowing permitted in music," and the maestro sa says, "Yes, as long as you pay back with interest." And I think that's I think that's my mo. I, I'm I I borrow and learn where I can and try to pay back with interest in some way by bringing something forward, bringing something to it that wasn't, wasn't there before. And I feel so strongly that my whole process of writing the December songs has been that. Uh, and, uh, you know, even borrowing from Hart Crane. And I think that's why it feels kind of rich and hopefully it, it feels well, I don't know who said there's a huge difference between old fashioned and timeless, but that's why Mozart can never be old fashioned and will always be timeless. And I always strive for that. Oh, and, you know, I probably rarely achieve it, but that's what I strive for. Well, I think you've accomplished it with, with December songs. I think it is truly timeless, which is why it resonates and feels fresh today. Um, and I want to conclude by asking you to. Uh, about who you are today and what you see for the future by by paraphrasing one of the lyrics from the last song on December songs. For you, Maury, is it amazing to still be here and a relief for you as we near 2023? Unquestionably. Uh, you know, we all live and we all go through everything we go through. Relationships, broken relationships, new relationships, illnesses, recoveries from illnesses, um, uh, uh, disappointments, in a career, you know, a miracles happen to you in a career. Um, yes, it's amazing to still be here. It, it it really is. And you know, I, you know, I, I look at the number of the, the number of years I'm apparently uh, uh, have been alive, but I just I just feel like the thirteen year old who discovered that I could make up stuff. It's that that part. Is perennially that age, perennially, you know, filled with wonder of it. The wonder of it all, it never ceases to amaze me. Uh, you know, and I've, you know, I'm, I'm so looking forward to these new projects that I, I'm working on. Uh, and and uh, uh, even thinking about, you know, something that I thought I would write as a show. And I'm thinking now I'll write it as a song cycle, but it'll be for a group of people, not just one. And because now that I know I can tell a story that way, uh, it's for even from a practical point of view, it makes more sense just to write it for a group of actors uh, and, and and to record it. So yeah, it's a it's a it it's something of a relief. But really, um, I very rarely have a feeling of relief at having done something. What I feel is uh, it, uh, an inspiration. So, you know, this this whole experience with Vicky and the December songs and with Larry and Ted and Tommy, it has just catapulted, catapulted me more uh, with more inspiration to just launch into something else. Uh, so, um, yeah, I feel like uh, I feel like Vicky feels at the end of it and uh, and looking forward to the rest of my life and my career. Well, I think we all are. And I really appreciate your taking the time to talk oh. about this and i hope that we can someday sit down for a very long lunch because i have a feeling we would we would have plenty to talk about oh i look forward to it i just just you got me information it's on me this time all okay. right well I, I will i will ask dan to forward your email to me okay i'll okay i know i'll forward to you i i've, I've got your email i'll say okay you. terrific all right i appreciate it thank you so much right. for your time take care it's nice to meet you and thank you for this wonderful conversation oh thank you have a right. great evening great bye bye, -bye.